Lady Arianne Lee Halon stood at the edge of the wide balcony and stared over the fields of Veridum, central continent of Byzantium Secundus. The rains had diminished to a mist, refracting onto rainbows heralding the setting sun. She fingered her new medallion hanging from her neck, a rising phoenix over a brightening star, the emblem of Emperor Alexius's questing knights. There would be great trials soon, conflicts and intrigue that seemed to warp and woof at her fate. For a moment, she regretted the bonds that had held her entourage to her. In these past three years, they had become more than traveling companions and aides. They were friends, the closest thing she had to family, now that her own kin had turned against her. She wished she could send them away, far from the troubles to come, but this was impossible. She would need them, their skills invaluable. As selfish as it seemed, she had a destiny to fulfill, and no noble worthy of the name could fail to live up to it regardless of the sacrifices called for. Let it begin, she said aloud. Come what may, I shall be ready. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I'll be your gaming monk for the evening. Since the days of pulp, there's always been something fascinating about science fantasy to me. This fusion of far future tech with classical sensibilities. While the style of storytelling is often called space opera, I think a lot of people focus too much on the space part and less on the opera. In most cases, this is done with a theme of larger than life characters in a world of past glories. This week's subject, Fading Suns, carries some of that thematic tone. While it's easy to compare this to Warhammer 40,000, and if you have, I don't blame you, that's more of a consequence of both games using the same inspiration in Dune. Plus, Fading Suns is less outright grimdark, and it focuses more on mysteries without and within. Unsurprisingly, it cites Dune, Hyperion, and Foundation as its strongest inspirations. Even with that, pinning down its core tone is difficult, since the setting is a very strong kitchen sink. Space opera is the main feature, yes, but it leaves how hopeful or hopeless the narrative is up to open interpretation. We'll be looking at the revised edition of this game. Does it still hold up, or has it faded like the stars in its story? Let's find out. Fading Suns Revised is split into a player's guide at 422 pages and a game master's guide at 389 pages. While that might seem a bit much, I'd argue it kind of needs that degree of space due to the game's emphasis on its setting. Fortunately, the player's guide isn't as overwhelming on that. I did notice a lot of reused art in the books, but this is one of those cases where it'd be inevitable with such a long-running game. It's not a deal-breaker, but I can't help but notice it. An issue I do have is some of the materials not being as self-contained as I'd like, for a better word. For example, the book doesn't mention the uses of Psy or Theurgy in the Characteristics chapter, or in their Specialized chapter, but in the Rules chapter. There's a few other organizational hiccups, but that's one of the stronger examples. At least there's an index. Fading Suns uses a life path like system for its creation, granting even starting characters a significant amount of background to draw stories from. We'll be exploring this with a questing knight named Sir Vega Hawkwood. While there's an alternative custom creation system, we won't be using it as it's not the assumed default. Before we begin, we have to apply the natural skills that act as the basis for the life path proper. This means we start with a rating of 3 in the body characteristics of strength, dexterity, and endurance, mind characteristics of perception, wits, and tech, and the spirit characteristics of presence, will, and faith. In addition, starting characters have a rating of 3 in the following skills. Phoenix Empire lore, Questing Knights Faction lore, Fight, Influence, Observe, Delphi Planetary lore, in this case the planet that Vega's from, Sneak, Throwing, and Vigor. The first step on the life path system proper is choosing a role. There are four roles in the game, which consist of broad archetypes of social class. This is a future medieval, after all. The four roles are nobles, priests, merchants, and aliens. Of the four, we're going with the noble role, as evidenced by the name Hawkwood, which means we have to choose one of the noble houses. In our case, well, House Hawkwood. The second step is upbringing, the early years of the character. This step is to split into three segments of upbringing, apprenticeship, and early career. The options between each part differ based on the choice of role. In our case, we'll be going with rural estate, soldier, and questing. 
Each of these provides the packages of bonuses to characteristics and skills, as well as granting traits in the form of blessings, curses, benefices, and afflictions. Characteristics in this regard are capped at 8. The third step is the extra stages, where the character pursues previous careers or dips into new ones. In this regard, we'll be going with Questing Night Tour of Duty and Psychic Awakening, after taking the first three powers from the Soma Path. The fourth step is the Worldly Benefit, a choice between three rewards after their career paths. Of the three, we'll go with, well, rewards. Lastly, we have 1,300 Firebirds to spend on our starting equipment. 1,000 is from the Cast Benefit, and another 300 as a stipend from being a Questing Knight. We'll be spending this on a Saber, Martek Gold Pistol, Synth Silk Armor, and a Standard Energy Shield, which leaves us with 180 Firebirds as pocket money. Fading Suns' character design is very late 90s, for lack of a better term. While the life path system makes it less intimidating than others, it's still going to be susceptible to the min-max conundrum that plagues a lot of games that had an advantage-disadvantage system similar to this. I'm sure some will find it restrictive, and thus be tempted to use the custom system. However, I'm of the opinion that the custom version doesn't quite fit the setting of medieval-esque social classes. The book even implies an at-your-own-risk attitude with the custom system. I want to make clear, character creation isn't bad per se, but it does suffer some tropes from its era. Namely, what I like to call the mage problem, which is something beyond the scope of this video. I'll have to tackle it in amusing later. Fading Suns uses the Victory Point system, which I have nicknamed D20 Blackjack, not to be confused with the D20 version of Fading Suns. We're not going to talk about that. Hopefully never. Anyways, the Victory Point system is a roll under setup based on the sum of attribute and skill, referred to as the goal. However, rolling low isn't necessarily the aim, although it is a safe approach. As the closer your rolls get to under the goal, you gain more degrees of success known as Victory Points. Now using Vega as an example, this would make his base roll with his saber have a goal number of 15, the sum of his melee and dexterity. That means he'd have to roll a 15 or less to succeed, so if he rolled a 6 in our example, he would gain 3 victory points. Now a critical success is when a die roll is equal to the goal number, allowing for a second roll. This second roll can add additional victory points. Now a critical failure is a natural 20. When you do this, you roll to confirm said critical. And if the second die fails, then it's a critical failure, otherwise it's merely an automatic failure. Within combat, initiative is the sum of dexterity and wits, along with a single d6. This is not the only time that d6 are used, referred to as effect dice. Effect die treat results of 1 through 4 as successes and anything higher as a failure. Alternatively, the d20 can be used where rolls of 13 or less are considered successes on effect die. The primary way these are used in combat is for damage and armor. So after making a successful attack, you may roll a number of effect die equal to the weapon's base and any victory points you gained. In the case of armor, your total armor's rating is rolled as effect die to cancel out damage. The final layer of defense is energy shields, which will negate damage based on its impact threshold, the minimum damage to activate it, and the force capacity, which is the maximum damage it will block. To bring this back to Vega, if his saber attack rolled an 8, that would grant him 4 victory points to add to his base damage of 6 with his saber, thus allowing him to roll up to 10 effect die, as he can pull his punches if he so chooses. Conversely, if he were hit by a successful attack that generated at least 1 victory point, he could roll 4 effect die to mitigate the damage. His energy shield, of course, would block any total damage between 5 and 10. All this, alongside the stance system of sliding goals and defenses, implies that combat is more about outmaneuvering rather than outright overpowering. It's certainly an interesting way to make even low damage characters somewhat viable, especially given the low amount of health that characters will have. Personally, I've attempted to experiment with 2d10 instead of a d20, since the probability spread is less flat, and it could make extreme rolls more special. I'm on the fence about whether that's better or worse, though. Overall, the victory point system is one that's going to be divisive, since it's operating against certain instincts. Most roll low or roll high systems want you to get as close to the extremes as possible, while Fading Suns is aiming to be closer to the middle. But we're not quite done with the victory point system quite yet. There's still two final pillars we need to address. Fading Suns' answer to magic and similar forms of supernatural power is Psy and Theurgy. Both of these utilize weird as fuel for their powers, and it can be used as a do-over resource by default, the equivalent to extra effort. 
A psychic or theurge will have a pair of positive and negative characteristics in this regard. We'll start with the former in the power of Psy, a controversial but effective method of supernatural power. Psy powers are categorized by paths, linear spheres of magic that has levels ranging from 1 to 10. Obviously, buying powers has to be done on a per-level basis, so one could not gain crushing hand without having lifting hand and throwing hand first. Lastly, a character's Psy rating indicates the highest level of power they can learn. When using a Psy power, you make a goal roll based on the power used, as it'll typically be Psy plus a relevant skill, as well as spend a minimum amount of weird the power requires. If successful, the power's effects resolve, plus any additional effects based on victory points. However, Psy is not without risk, which is represented in its dark twin known as Urge. The most common way to gain Urge is fumbling a power roll, which grants at least one Urge. Now, Urge has its own level of Urge powers, which are controlled by the GM. The idea with this is that Urge is the psychic's shoulder devil that grows and influences Urge increases, from exerting control over their powers subtly, up to separating from the psychic completely and becoming their own being. The Urge works similar to Psy, however, it's a more ritualistic affair than the relatively fire-and-forget nature of Psy. Components are the main form that this difference manifests, as most theurgic effects use either liturgy, i.e. words, gesture, or prayer. Theurgy can be performed without the components, but the goal roll takes a minus three penalty when doing so. Lastly, theurgy has its own dark twin in hubris, which is gained in a similar way. Hubris effects are not rolled in the same way that urge powers are. They become active on special circumstances, which is why they're largely described through narrative instead of using pure crunch. In that regard, one could make a fast-slow comparison between Psy and Theurgy, but much like Limit and Exalted, I could see this being abused by certain GMs. That GM. But that's going to be a mileage may vary thing. That said, I like the theme of power at a price, although hubris effects might be a little too reliant on narrative for my taste. It's a net positive, with just a little bit of missing the mark. Fading Suns has been called by some as 40k light, or 40k meets Traveler. Yes, as I said before, Fading Suns and Warhammer 40,000 take inspiration from Dune. But I'd say that Fading Suns wears far more of its pulp SF influence on its sleeve by comparison. So the whole 40k meets Traveler is close, but I'd say it's more of a happy medium between the two, in both a stylistic and mechanical sense. Its victory point system might appear backwards, but in my experience it clicked a lot better when I compared it to Blackjack. It does have its shortcomings, and its combat style might be a little too lethal and or volatile for the operatic slash passion play theme it wants to go for. That said, I'm willing to give the game a stamp of strongly recommended. Despite a few drawbacks, the system remains very strong. Unlike some of its contemporaries, I'm more willing to recommend this than other games in its subgenre because it doesn't have as much of a metaplot problem. It's still there, just not as much. The point by aspects don't quite age as well as some of the other mechanics, but it overall holds up. Now while the grim darkness of the 41st millennium has only war, the dark age of the 6th millennium has endless mysteries on the edges of space. 